Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started since we have a lot of information to cover today. So welcome again to our webinar on communicating with and about people with disabilities. And this is uh, presented by the National Center for Health and Public Health. All right, and then here we have um, our disclaimer. So the national, the information that is presented today or content and conclusions are those of the author only and should not be considered as the official position or policy, nor should any endorsements be inferred by HRSA, HHS, or the US government. And also the mission of NCHPH is to strengthen the capacity of federally funded public housing primary care health centers and other health center grantees by providing training and, and a range of technical assistance. And this is just a brief introduction about the speakers today. My name is Fida Pineda Sandoval and I am the TTA manager here at NCHPH and I will be helping Dr. Jose Leon moderate Dr. Jose Leon is the Chief Medical Officer at the National Center for Health and Public Housing. And this is just uh, some reminders about housekeeping items. All participants are muted upon entry. Um, in today's sessions, we anticipate that we will um, have a few activities where, where, where we're going to hopefully have your engagement um, happening during the session. So please make sure that you engage in the chat, that you also raise your hand if you would like your line to be unmuted. Um, this meeting is also being recorded and the slides in the recorded link will be sent via email after today's session. And here we have a quick announcement about and a reminder also to all of the health centers that may be attending our session today. We have the 2024 Training and Technical Assistance Needs Assessment Evaluation that is currently happening. And we invite you to complete this survey by November 1st. The assessment um, about this survey is released every three years and is used to identify priority training topics and professional development needs. And please, please try to complete the survey as this is going to be very useful information for all of the TTA um, assistance partners. And here we have some other announcements as well. We have our three upcoming activities in the next few months. Um, we have our Health Center Preparedness and Response Forum on Emerging Issues happening on October 16th. We also have another disabilities webinar, which will be focusing on screening for violence in people living with disabilities on November 12th. And on November 13th, we also have a webinar on the intersection of HIV, aging, and housing considerations for health centers. We will be providing the registration links in the chat shortly. Okay, thank you. And um, here we have some background information about those health centers that are located in or immediately accessible to public housing. So according to 2023 UDS data, um, there, were, there were over 1,300 FQHCs that served to 31 million patients. 475 of those FQHCs are near public housing that served to 6.5 million patients. And 107 public housing primary care grantees served to over 900,000 patients in 2023. Thank you. And then um, here we have some patient demographics data on public housing primary care health centers. So based on UDS 2023 data as well, 77.36% uh, were below federal poverty level. Uh, we also had 58.15% that were female, 29.96% 29 that were children, elderly 10.75% and uninsured 18.9%. And then here we also have uh, an, an overview of the public housing resident demographics data, where according to the HUD picture of subsidized adults, there were 1.6 million residents, two persons per household, 32% that were female headed with children households, 35% were children, 40% elderly, and 23% that were disabled amongst persons in households. 
90% were very low income. And in terms of um, ethnicity, 42% were black, non-Hispanic, 29% white, non-Hispanic, and 26% Hispanic. And now I'll pass it on to Dr. Jose Leon that will lead the rest of the webinar. Thank you, Fide. Hello, everyone. It's such a great pleasure to have you all. Thank you so much for attending this webinar. We are very pleased to have you all and have a conversation about uh, people with disabilities. This is a very important topic for all health centers and for primary care providers in general. And uh, we are going to learn together a couple of strategies on how we can talk to and discuss uh, issues, healthcare issues with our patients with disabilities. These are our learning objectives for today's session. And we also have the opportunity to have Dr. Lombardi with us. He is the Director of uh, Health of uh, Research Policy uh, here at the National Center for Healthy Public Housing and someone with a lot of experience providing training and technical assistance as well. So we are very uh, happy and honored to have Dr. Lombardi. So we are gonna get started. Uh, and we have uh, uh, an interaction and let us know what you think that you can use the chat box for this uh, myth or fact questions. And let us know what you think about uh, the uh, statements that we have on the screen and whether or whether you believe this is a myth or a fact. So the first one that we have is people with disabilities are brave, courageous, and inspirational for living with their disability. Is that a myth or a fact? What do you guys think? You can use the chat box. Uh, you can say whether the statement is a myth or the statement is a fact or is true or false. Uh, please uh, use the, the webinar chat box. Uh, we have uh, many here who have already responded. Thank you so much to all of you guys participating. And I see that most are saying it's a myth. I see a true. In reality, the this the, this will depend on what side of the equation you are, because for some people with disabilities, uh, or for us, you know, we we see all people with disability as inspirational people, people who really like, you know, or, or, or who bring uh, um, a sense of courage to us. But in reality. These are people who are struggling. These are people who are having issues. These are people who are not um, um, trying to, to show that they are brave. They are patients. They are uh, people that have a, a disability, but in reality, they are trying to sh make sure you know that they have and they are respected the same way that we respect other patients. And we have Dr. Lombardi who would like to uh, 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 chime in on this. What do you think, Dr. Lombardi? Yeah, you know, I like what you're saying, Jose, and I like questions like this because they make us uh, think about it like that. And, you know, I think of some of the the patients that I've had that have been dis that have had disabilities, and uh, especially after COVID, I had a lot of primary care patients who had been, um, in some cases, totally disabled by the, uh, by the condition and the sequelae. And I got to know a lot of those individuals when they were just coming to the self-actualization that that was their life and were adapting to their new lifestyles. And I will say that uh, these words that we say, brave, courageous, and inspirational, I, I think they can absolutely des describe the process, but every your disabled patients are, aren't really your disabled patients at the end of the day, they're Tom or Joe. And they want to be seen as Tom or Joe in the end. So uh, I think it's important to understand and appreciate the challenges that they go through, but also understand that they're Tom or Joe. Thank you, Dr. Lombardi. That's, that's, that's excellent. And you are right. Fide, I am having some issues. There we go. It's back. So the next question is, 
Myth or fact, there are many invisible disabilities. Is this a myth or a fact? Let us know what you think. Lita, can you take a look at this chat, please? Um, because if I do it, I seem that the computer freezes up on me. You are muted, Kitty. Sorry about that. So, yep, majority of the respondents are saying this is a fact. And in reality, this is a fact. We have other conditions that we can't see. Uh, we have some uh, substance abuse disorders on some other conditions such as depression or anxiety, uh, or patients with autism and learning disabilities. And the last one that we have is whether or not people with autism feel love. Or true. And that's a fact, mm -hmm. even though they cannot express or we cannot see how they are expressing love, they are able to feel love and to express love in a, sometimes in a way that we, we, not them, we don't understand. So uh, it's very important, you know, to know all these uh, myths or facts because it's going to, uh, we are going to uh, see how we can interact with our patients we have one more uh whether this whether or not this is a myth or fact or a fact people with down syndrome die young is that a myth or a fact majority of respondents are saying this is a myth we also have a few responses that say it's a fact thank you Peter. and in reality this is a myth uh it used to be you know, uh, the, um, in the past, we used to have uh, patients with Down syndrome dying in, uh, young, but now with the advances that we have and how we better identify some conditions, they are living longer and having a full life. So this is uh, um, something interesting to know. And the reason why NCHPH is focusing on uh, people with disabilities. In reality, we saw uh, the first slide that Fide showed, um, uh, and the slide had information on the percentage of people with disabilities living in public housing. And 23% of the households uh, um, have at least a person with disability, which is similar to the national data and the U.S. percentage uh, data of people with disabilities is uh, 28, almost 29%. And remember that these patients are more likely to be obese, to smoke, to have heart conditions, and have diabetes. And the interesting part of it is that uh, health centers are not required uh, to report patients with disabilities. So we, in reality, we don't know how many, you know, or what percentage of the patients coming to our uh, health centers have a disability. Uh, Dr. Lombardi? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so I, I just wanted to answer one of the questions I saw pop up in the chat, Jose, if you don't mind. Okay, please. Uh, and it's about your last your last uh, your last question about individuals with Down syndrome, and I see Cindy Parsley um, uh, mentioned that the these individuals may live longer than they used to, but still disproportionately die younger than those without disabilities. I wanted to address that because mathematically speaking, she is correct. I I think the 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 point that to focus on from that content though. Uh, is the severe difference that we've made in this in just a generation or a couple of generations. Uh, and this is primarily in like the cardiovascular regularities that often come with Down syndrome. And these individuals now live into their 60s, 70s, and 80s routinely. And uh, the gap between a someone without this condition and with this condition is getting smaller every year. We're not quite there yet, 
but uh, the uh, the focus was more, uh, this is something to pat ourselves on the back about. We are continually treating these patients more effectively, and uh, that's the reality of our practice now. Thank you, Dr. Lombardi. And you are, you are right. I, I, I fully agree with your statements. Uh, and I think that we are not there yet, but we are making progress and we are trying to help our patients uh, the same way that we help uh, uh, other patients with uh, the, who are not disabled, who have no any disability to live, uh, to live longer. So uh, the all federal organizations are doing what they can uh, and addressing uh, the issue of uh, disabilities amongst our populations. Uh, we have had uh, recently released this statement during the uh, anniversary of the American Disabilities and uh, Disabilities Act, and um, just showing you know the interest and what they are doing to address the need, the housing needs of uh, people with disabilities. And if you are familiar with HUD, they have uh, programs uh, offering offering uh, housing choices for those with uh, disabilities. Uh, Dr. Lombardi uh, worked on this particular infographic that I uh, that is on the screen. And what he did was that he compared the uh, disabilities or the different type of disabilities amongst uh, the different populations in the United States. The data, uh, he took this data from the Health Center Patient Survey, and uh, he analyzed uh, the different um, disabilities uh, and compared the disabilities based on whether or not the patient had uh, housing issues or if the patient were all FQIC patients without housing concerns and compared it to the uh, general population in the United States is uh, really interesting to see uh, according to the results that Dr. Lombardi got that 35.4% of patients, almost 36% of hard assisted health center patients reported a cognitive disability in 2022. Also, uh, the results show that a 30 or over 30% 30 of public housing patients reported a uh, mobility uh, disability. And 20.3% of those uh, patients uh, uh, re receiving services uh, uh, in uh, these health, health centers located in or immediately accessible to public housing reported an independent living disability in 2022. So uh, we have a poll question for, for you. Uh, Fide, you can help me with the poll question. Sure, yeah. All right, so in this poll question, we'd like to know, how comfortable would you feel approaching a patient with a disability in the health center setting or the community? We'll allow a few more seconds. Excellent. So those are the, the results are that 37% said quite comfortable, 16% of respondents said neutral, 37% also said somewhat comfortable, and 11% quite comfortable. Thank you, Fide, and I'm glad to, to see this, uh, these results because in reality, uh, there are several studies out there showing that in primary care, we are having some issues. Uh, there are some providers who are, who, who are not familiar with the population and therefore they are not comfortable enough to provide health services to uh, our patients uh, with uh, with a disability. So it's important uh, because we have seen the need to provide these services. And we are not talking just about uh, a patient who is coming to our practice or is coming to our health center because this patient is sick or this patient has a chronic medical condition or this patient is uh, having an acute condition. Uh, there are data out there 
that uh, only 5.3% of people with disability receive a screening for other chronic medical conditions in the United States. So it's not only to treat the patient, but also make sure that they receive the preventive services that all health centers offer to this population. We're talking about breast cancer screening, cervical cancer screening, uh, colorectal cancer screening, diabetes screening, and, uh, and not all patients are receiving this screening. The reason is that uh, going back to the introduction, sometimes we are confused with what is a myth or what is a fact and how this is uh, affecting the populations that we serve. Uh, we have different populations. And um, if you are familiar with the, the special, the HRSA special populations, we have those living in public housing. We have those migrant and agricultural workers. We have people experiencing homelessness. And we have other special populations. We have the school-based health centers. We have those serving the LGBTQ community. We have all those uh, serving our seniors over the age of 65, but we have no uh, programs um, for patients with disabilities. So this is uh, a gap that we need to address and something that we have to make sure that we develop some practices or policies to address the issue and make sure that we serve our populations in a better way. We know uh, the myth of, uh, we just have a very brief discussion on the patients uh, with uh, Down syndrome. And uh, because uh, there must be a misconception that they don't live uh, or they don't, they, 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 they die young, uh, probably we are not offering the same type of services that we offer to other populations who have no other type of disability. Uh, Fide, can you take over? It seems that my computer froze up on me. I'm sorry. Sure, yeah. Let me go ahead and... Actually, Fide, if I could toss a comment in. I uh, I disabled Jose's computer because I wanted to say something. Um, okay. uh, it's quicker than putting the hand up. Um, but I, I, I just want to address the comfortability aspect of it because I think this is a part that in clinical practice uh, is, is a reality of working with individuals that have disabilities as many of us do feel uncomfortable when we're providing for them. And I, I think that stems from a lot of things. I think it stems from lack of exposure, uh, but more deeply it stems from our concern that we're not able to communicate with that patient. Uh, for those of us who are working with, with primarily patients that do not have disabilities, uh, we form a certain confidence with our ability to work with individuals that are like that. Uh, an individual with disabilities requires often an individualized approach to meet their needs clinically, uh, communicatively, and so forth. And those competencies take years to develop. Uh, when I'm thinking of this and I'm thinking of how I've reacted over the years to um, working with individuals with various types of disabilities, physical and cognitive. The more exposure I have to those um, individuals, the more I'm able to communicate to them in a way that, that's meaningful to them and that kind of checks their boxes. When you understand individuals, um, when, you, when you build that clinical, uh, clinical body of knowledge, it, it provides so many benefits when seeing individuals with, with disabilities and you really need to get it by doing it. Thank you, mm -hmm. Dr. Lombardi. Frida, can you share your screen? Thank you, yep. Yeah, I'm pulling them up right now. So we should be able to see the slide now. Right. Yes. So, yes. All right. So now we're going to um, get started with the second poll polling question. I can just see my option here. All 
All right, so for our polling question, does your health center or organization have a strategy to provide preventive services for people with disabilities? So 63% of participants said yes, and 38% said no. Excellent. Uh, and again, I am uh, very pleased to see this result. Next slide, please. Because as I mentioned, uh, there are some studies that we reviewed. Uh, the uh, Agency for Health Research and Quality just released a research that's showing that only 5.3% of patients with disabilities uh, are receiving um, a screening for some of the chronic medical conditions that uh, we have, uh, that we need to screen our populations. So uh, I am very happy to see that. And uh, there is different studies out there showing uh, some physicians not able to offer the uh, services or health services to patients with disabilities because of different reasons. There are structural barriers. As we know, uh, there are some clinics and I am not talking about health centers. I'm talking about safety net providers in general who may not have the equipment or the uh, um, settings to provide services to patients with physical disabilities. And also there are some attitudes, attitudes in, uh, against uh, patients many physicians and people in general and providers believe that sometimes our patients are abusing the disability uh, aspect and in reality that they are not disabled. And so uh, there is this um, kind of false uh, attitude against uh, uh, our patients. And then uh, how you can communicate with your patients we have not been trained to provide these services to our patients with disabilities. Uh, do we have uh, the technology? Do we have the um, sometimes uh, translators or in, uh, to, to provide the services? Oh, so all these barriers are showing that in many places, primary care providers in general are not well prepared to provide health services and preventive services to our patients with disabilities. Next slide, please. So the question is, what is a disability? Uh, we've been talking about disabilities and is a term that is very difficult to understand sometimes or to grasp uh, the, the meaning. And the reason is that the list is growing. Uh, we have um, some conditions now that we are now considering a disability. In the past, uh, anxiety and depression, for instance, were not included. Now, anxiety, depression, and other um, you know, mental health conditions are, are being added to the list. But uh, the, the universal term is that a disability is a physical or mental impairment that limits one or more major life activities or activities. Uh, if you have a patient who is uh, or who has any of these uh, physical or mental issues, then uh, your patient has a disability regardless of the degree. Uh, we, you, we can see um, different uh, issues that, oh, this is a mild, cognitive impairment or a severe cognitive issue. In reality, we are not measuring. We are just making sure that regardless of the um, degree or level of disability, or pa all patients are included in the definition. Next slide, please. So the next issue is what is the difference between illness and disability, 
really interesting because mo many times we are going to have patients with disabilities who are coming to our clinics, who are coming to our health centers, to our clinical sites, and their disability is not their concern. So uh, next slide, please. They are coming for something different and you can have a patient who, who is having some uh, issues, either emotional issues or physical issues and they are not coming to see you or they are not coming to the clinic for those issues. So we need to make sure that we see the difference, that we know that in some cases, the patient is the expert when we talk about the disability, whereas when we have an, a condition, uh, is the doctor or the nurse or the provider the expert providing all the support to the patients? And this is very, very important. The reason is that when we are not the experts, when we are not those um, who can have the uh, leading the conversation, we can feel uh, uncomfortable. And that's some of the reasons why some um, clinicians or providers don't like to have conversation with uh, people with disability. Sometimes that one having the disability knows more than us about the disability. And uh, that is something that we are not trained uh, to have this conversation with the, with our patients. And the other difference, and we need to make sure that we understand this, is that uh, the goal when you have a patient is the patient wants to get rid of it. Uh, if you have an illness and you have the flu or you go to the clinic because you have uh, any other acute or chronic condition, you don't want to have it. Whereas uh, someone with disability, the patient has learned to live with a disability. So our patient understand, knows, and have, uh, and have adapted to live with a disability. So these are things that we need to make sure that we understand. These are things we've been talking uh, through many of our trainings about health literacy, about cultural competency, about um, diabetes and A1C, and, and we receive all this training, but uh, sometimes we don't have the training on how to communicate with our patients, okay, specifically with those patients with disabilities. Next slide, please. Yeah. This is a great point that you're pointing out here, Dr. Now. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. It is so, why? Why is disability relevant to us as doctors? Um, first, barriers in healthcare access. We have already mentioned, we have been discussing social determinants of health. We've been discussing uh, transportation issues. We've been discussing uh, um, how difficult it is for some patients to access a screening for some of the uh, uh, preventable diseases. Um, we've been talking about uh, access to work, uh, access to to employment, access to education. And now we see that our patients with disabilities are more likely to have a barriers when it comes to access to care. Next, next slide, please. So next, please. So there are some uh, uh, behaviors that, um, that we have, you know, um, and that we don't uh, put into practice. Sometimes we don't listen to we don't listen to our patients. We just we, for several reasons, we have uh, many patients waiting, and sometimes you need some extra time to offer services to someone with a physical disability, for instance. And uh, uh, or uh, we don't know how to explain treatment. Uh, some some patients so they understand what you are providing to to the patient. Uh, we have patients who are coming with a, a relative or a family member, and uh, the patient has a disability. And sometimes we see uh, the clinician, the doctor, or whomever is providing service 
to start talking to the, the person who is coming to the clinic with our patients and not with our patients. We uh, sometimes uh, we have other issues, you know, on how we can uh, involve patients in treatment decisions or we don't do we don't spend enough time with them? You know, I mean, we've been talking about a screening. We've been talking about um, the time that it takes to have a conversation with someone with a cognitive issue and making sure that the patient understand. And sometimes we don't have the time. We don't have the, the patient to explain this to our patients. So we need to make sure that we develop these uh, communi uh, communication strategies to make sure that we are including our patients in the conversation and we, pro we are providing exactly the same services that we provide to any other patient coming to our clinics. Next slide, please. Then if we have uh, negative uh, uh, behaviors, what is happening is that sometimes we are not providing uh, the uh, ideal treatment to our patients. We are um, just giving uh, alternatives to, to the patients we make, uh, because oh, this patient has this issue, probably the patient is going to die young, is going to have any other issues, is not going to understand what I'm saying. So uh, let's provide an inferior type of treatment. And we neglect, and as I mentioned, only 5.3% of our patients with disabilities are receiving uh, preventive services, uh, we don't have conversations with our patients about uh, tobacco use, which is also a big concern in, in public housing. One third of those living in public housing are current smokers. We don't talk uh, with our patients about um, um, sexual education. We don't provide uh, information about birth control. So all these causes mistrust. Uh, go ahead, uh, Dr. Lombardi. Yeah, I just want to get behind you on this, uh, Jose, because I think you're you're right. Uh, we make as individuals, uh, we have preconceived notions about individual disabilities, even those of us who know better. It, it, society strengthens those every day. Um, and uh, because of that, we miss a lot of core competencies with uh, individuals with disabilities. And the, the sexual education is something that comes to mind because that's one of the areas where we miss the most. Um, some of these individuals never receive sexual education from their provider. Uh, and uh, it, it's important as a provider to bridge those gaps and to be able to provide those patients with the same care that we would give to someone if they didn't have a disability. So I appreciate you mentioning that. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lombardi. Next slide, please. Thank you. Also, I just wanted to remind everyone, if you feel that like you would like to chime in or share anything related to what we're currently discussing, please feel free to raise your hand and, um, and your line will also be unmuted. Thank you, Gia. So remember, if we understand the challenges, we will be able to offer uh, solutions to our patients. And we can start by trying to reduce barriers to care, making sure that we have the empathy, that we have the time, and we have the knowledge to talk to our patients. Next slide, please. So uh, we have a video that is going to help us uh, continue with the conversation. So hopefully it's going to work. Uh, the, uh, the video is going to work. Really. Mm -hmm. Let me know. My name is Carol. And I have an eye condition that I developed at age seven years old called retinitis pigmentosa. We call it RP for short. So I have been for over 50 years and all these years later I had hardly any visual capacity mostly like perception I just took a tell you a little bit about myself we raised three children by myself and at age 38 I went back to college 
I can create a medical transcription. I can work at the hospital in Portland, Oregon for 18 years. He was a software program for visioning very people hold jobs. And in speech, as I can see my, my screen, and that my coworkers used to get me sometimes that I was surfing on that when I had my screen off instead of working. All right. Next slide, please. So uh, the video was a little bit uh, difficult to, at least on my end, but let's have a, a conversation about our, our patient. And let's say that you are going to see Pamela and uh, she's coming to see you for headaches and uh, you have a colleague, you are not you are not comfortable with patients with disabilities and you are uh, nervous or anxious, you know, on how to approach a patient who is uh, disabled. So what is going, uh, what is strategy, uh, you know, do you think you need to, in order to uh, have a open conversation with your patients? Next slide, please. So um, to feel uh, anxious is quite normal when we have a patient and sometimes we don't know exactly how to communicate with the patients. And it's not only in clinical settings, it's any, uh, in any interaction that we have with, a, with someone when we don't understand, when we have uh, issues trying to communicate, uh, we tend to feel anxious and um, it's, it's normal. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So there's different reasons why we don't know uh, uh, how to how to talk to our patient. First, uh, we need to know more about the condition. We need to know uh, what other uh, issues, uh, either social or family issues, are affecting our patient. So it's always always important to establish this communication with the patients not only to know about their condition, about their disease, about why they are coming to the clinic, but getting uh, other aspects of the daily life. Uh, why, I mean, number of people who uh, did, did the patient live with, uh, number of um, whether or not this patient has a stable housing, what, uh, whether or not this person has an employment, and how she does compared to others, and how is she? Uh, how she, in this case, uh, it, it, the patient is able to communicate. So uh, we have issues. A. What if the patient doesn't understand what I'm saying? What if the patient is having other uh, conditions that I am not familiar with? So next slide, please. So the other thing is, we always, always are the ones who want to be in control, right? So when someone else is in control, uh, we are not, we are not going to feel well. Uh, we are going to say, hey, I'm the doctor. So I am supposed to come and talk to this patient and uh, the patient needs to see me as the authority. Uh, uh, and uh, in this case, I, I'm not sure whether or not if she, or if, if this person starts talking about a condition that probably I'm not fam fully familiar with, how she's going to look at me and whether or not she's going to trust me. And so all these things are normal and something that can create anxiety when you are uh, having conversation with your patients. But in reality, uh, the the most important step here is to gather information about other issues around the patients and not just the condition for which the patient is coming to the clinic. Next slide, please. Next slide. Now, the can you go back, uh, either just one? There's something interesting. Um, 
and is related to the to the slide uh, and it's uh, the section where we have there's no algorithm for her blindness so sometimes we develop an algorithm for each condition so we have if we have a patient with um, a heart condition we know uh, we first you know we need to know the blood pressure we need to know you know the the heartbeat whether or not uh, the patient has arrhythmia or something else and we follow some steps sometimes when we have patients with disabilities we don't have those steps and uh, we are not feeling well as as providers when we are not having you know all these cascade of of, of steps that we follow every time that we have a conversation with our patients. Next slide, please. So why might we feel uncomfortable working with individuals with disabilities? Next slide. What did we learn about Pamela? I mean, we saw the video. Next. And uh, if you were able to 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 uh, to have you know the entire uh, um, uh, the entire uh, dialogue, you know, the, or, or what Pamela said, we learned that she raised three children, that she pursued and finished college, that she works as a medical transcriptionist, that she is socially connected and jokes around uh, with colleagues and has a visual impairment and sees only variations in light. So just by getting this information, you are going to feel more comfortable. You are going to, you are going to feel that you have more information that you are obtaining from your patients. And you will learn that this patient participates in society. She has a, an employment that she enjoys recreational activities and she nurtures her relationships. And just by knowing that, you are going to feel better and you are going to uh, feel that you have a better understanding of your patient. And not only uh, you need to focus on the disability or the reason why she's coming to your clinic. Next slide, please. Remember that all patients are entitled to access to information. So uh, if our patient with uh, disabilities, they need equal access to information. Remember, for instance, if you have a blind person like Pamela coming, you know, uh, the patient receive, uh, coming to your clinic, the patient receive information uh, either electronically or, or the, the, depending on the preference of the patient, but they need to receive the information you know that they are entitled to um or uh if you have a patient who has a, a disability and you need a, a sign language interpreter make sure that you have uh, uh everything ready you know to obtain uh, a person who is going to help you with uh, uh communicating with the patient next slide please Now, one of the biggest issues that we, uh, or the, one of the biggest mistakes that we have, that we uh, make sometimes is thinking that our patient is so disabled. And Dr. Lombardi mentioned um, uh, in a very, uh, in, a, in a really good way, how sometimes we refrain from uh, having conversation about uh, uh, sexual education with our patients just because the patient has a disability. And uh, that is something that, I mean, we are stigmatizing sometimes our patients and we need to make sure that we, I mean, uh, other thing that we have to do is not to stigmatize, making sure that the patient is receiving exactly the same care that you are providing to any other patient coming to the clinic. Or we are uh, just not offering uh, preventive care. And I just, I'm not going to, uh, get tired of highlighting this, only 5.3% of patients with disabilities are being offered preventive 
share. So make sure that we also address that issue. Next slide, please. Well, Jose, I, I you know, if I interrupt you for a second, because um, the sexual education part, you know, when you look at the data, it's kind of easy to see where clinicians are having the conversations and where they're not. And two demographics where the rates of sexually uh, transmitted infections risen significantly are those over 65 and, and individuals with a physical or cognitive disability. And I ask myself, how much does that have to do with the pro providers not screening appropriately for that? I think these things follow. Um, it's uh, uncomfortable at times to talk about sexual history with any patient. Uh, training in the past hasn't been great about that, but uh, there are a few poor competencies to the clinical exam that have had big impact on public health and uh, as, as just doing a good old fashioned sexual history that answers the questions. So I'll get off my soapbox, but. Thank you, Kevin. And this is a, this is a really good segue. Uh, we have a webinar, an upcoming webinar on this particular issue that Dr. Lombardi mentioned. And so if you have not registered for this webinar, please do so. Fide has already or is going to share the link. Uh, or you can come to our website or take a look at our um, uh, materials. Uh, we always send emails to um, our webinar uh, subscribers, uh, making sure that you also attend this webinar because it is a very important issue to address. Next slide, please. Yep, and also I didn't want to mention that I, I included the links, the registration link in the, in the slide deck that I shared with everyone in the chat. Thank you, Fide. So some communication tips. First, again, let's make sure that we know for patients that if you can even prepare in advance, that if you have a list of your patients that you are going to see, and this is the first time, you know, try to get more information. Um, if you have uh, uh, an individual, and uh, the individual has some issues and cannot understand, just make sure that you repeat as many times as you can so the patient understand uh, uh, your advice, your clinical advice, or your recommendations or your treatment guidelines. Uh, make sure that you offer pieces of information that uh, is important not to overwhelm patients with information. And this is for all patients, not only for patients with disabilities. And making sure they use the teach back method is the same uh, ask the patient if possible that the patient repeats uh, what you're saying and if not, uh, making sure that the patient uh, them, uh, uh, understand your verbal instructions. And uh, use uh, pictures or visual aids for some patient is important. Uh, making sure that we have uh, materials in place. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we ask um, whether or not your clinic was prepared to have a patient with disabilities or how comfortable you are, you know, because if you think that you are going to need materials uh, to communicate with your patients and uh, you don't have them making sure that you either create your materials or you can go to different federal sites where you can find materials on how to communicate. Uh, with your patients. Uh, I can mention the Centers for Disease Control. They have a disability section that is very, very um, useful, as well the Administration for Community Living and other organizations just pro uh, uh, providing services to uh, people with uh, intellectual disabilities. Now, next slide, please. Uh, make sure that you repeat back, you know, uh, making sure that the patient, uh, um, the, the patient repeat back to your instructions, making sure that they understand, uh, please, uh, refrain to ask uh, yes or no questions. Uh, you need to get, you know, more information from your patients. Don't talk to the patient as if they were, uh, children. They are not children, they are patients and they deserve um, the same respect that you have to your to other patients. And um, do not assume that the patient cannot make their own decisions. Next slide. 
Now, for patients with learning disabilities, uh, other tips on how to communicate with them. Uh, yeah, we can ask the patients uh, how you can uh, give them the information, how they prefer to receive information. Um, make sure that during the verbal instructions, you somehow show them exactly what you are referring to. You know, if you are talking about food portions and if you have, again, some materials, making sure that you offer and you show, you know, and it's not, this is not just for clinicians. We are talking about social workers. We are talking about uh, health educators. We are talking about CHWs providing services to our populations. And then uh, try to minimize distractions. So let's make sure that when you are having and you are explaining to uh, our patients with any uh, learning disability that there are no distractions whatsoever. Next slide, please. Now, we have also uh, tips for people with mental disabilities. Again, uh, the message needs to be uh, communicated uh, calmly, softly, quietly. Um, making sure that um, that uh, if you think that you are going too fast, uh, slow down, making sure that the patient is understanding. Again, uh, ask the patient to repeat what you are saying. And if the patient did not understand, let's start all over again and be willing to repeat yourself. Listen, listen and listen. That is a key. I mean, we need to listen to our patients. We need to make sure that we understand, that we respect our patients, that uh, if the patient has any other issues, let's say that you have a patient with a schizophrenia and the patient has some delusions, and uh, do not challenge them. Uh, just make sure that you are providing and you are uh, communicating the message. Yeah, do not make uh, sudden moves, do not make the patient nervous and be patient. Be patient, uh, listen and speak slowly when you have patients with mental disabilities. Next slide, please. Remember that um, some Patients, again, like uh, some patients with some mental disorders like uh, schizophrenia uh, can have a delusion or uh, other issues and, and that's the reality. Uh, make sure that you are not making fun, that you are not uh, talking to others and referring about the delusion with other people in the uh, exam room, uh, uh, that you are being as professional as you are with any other patient, making sure that uh, that you are experienced, that, that, that don't, don't follow the delusion or the hallucination with your patient. Uh, oh, if the patient says uh, that he's or she's seen something, uh, do not follow that. Don't say, it. oh yes, I, I see it as well. Just go back and, and to the point that you are trying to communicate to your patient, making sure that he understands that uh, the patient has a better grasp, so you know, of what, what you are communicating to your patient, instructions, um, next uh, appointments, etc. So um, make sure that um, that you once you start the conversation with your patient, you are the one providing the conversation with uh, the, and finalizing the conversation with your patient, that you are not going to uh, uh, refer within the clinic to another doctor because you started and you don't know how to continue the conversation. Makes, let's make sure that you, if you started the conversation, you are going to end the conversation with your patients. Next slide, please. Um, I just want to. Uh, we have this case study. Uh, 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 I think that we are running out of time. Uh, Fide has already shared the slides with all of you, so I'm going to stop here, Fide, and see whether there is any uh, any uh, questions or comments. Uh, but the slides um, are the tool that you can use, um, you know, to uh, continue your education about this topic. And if you have any other questions, please make sure that you send your questions to us. Uh, Fide? No, that was it. I just wanted to do like a quick 
uh, time check. But... So, uh, so thank you so much, everyone. Uh, if you don't have any questions, please make sure that um, if you have any questions, uh, uh, don't hesitate to contact Dr. Lombardi, uh, who is the Director of Research and Policy and Health Promotion here, or FIDE, our Training and Technical Assistant Manager, or myself. Uh, we are always happy to help you with any of your training needs. And uh, thank you so much for attending this activity. We are very glad to have you all. And please make sure that you attend our next webinar that is on violence and uh, on disabilities. Thank you so much and have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you, everyone. And please complete our post-evaluation survey before you leave. It's just something that will also help us improve our future sessions. Thank you. Here's our contact information. And have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Fide.